Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Matthew Jane, and I'm the Museum Education and Engagement Coordinator for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars, presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month, explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to current day. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at history.iowa.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you'd like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we'll have an overview of the history of the Iowa Precinct Caucuses, featuring stories of important people, events, and campaigns, and we'll also highlight artifacts from the collections of the State Historical Museum of Iowa. Now, a few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in just a few days. I've disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature through the webinar. My colleague, Jess Frenlet, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for our speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all the questions before we run out of time today. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, our presenter today, Leo Landis. State Curator Leo Landis has a Bachelor of Science in History from the Iowa State University and a Master's of Arts in Historical Administration from Eastern Illinois University. He has completed all but his dissertation towards a PhD in history from Iowa State University. His museum experience includes time at Living History Farms in Urbandale, Connor Prairie in Fishers, Indiana, and eight years as a curator at Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. He also worked as a curator and director of education at Salisbury House in Des Moines. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Leo to begin the webinar. Well, thank you so much, Matt. And thank you, Jess. And, and thank you to all the people watching live and, uh, also to anybody that watches in the future. So uh, as Matt said, we're gonna talk about uh, the still first in the nation role of Iowa in the precinct caucus process. And uh, if you uh, haven't paid attention to Iowa code and political precinct caucuses, it is in Iowa law. This was something that was passed in 1985. So we had been first in the nation uh, since 1972. Uh, that's not where we're starting, though. We're going to start with a 1985 legislative change that mandates that the Iowa precinct caucuses really must be the first in the nation for presidential election year. So uh, the way the law is written is saying that they uh, should not be held later than the fourth Monday in February of each even numbered year overall, and that uh, eight days earlier than what would be typically the New Hampshire primary. And uh, we'll give a little bit of background on how this change happened, both nationally and then Iowa coming first. And as Matt said, talk about some uh, of the important people and issues uh, and so events and a few artifacts too, as, as we discuss this process. And uh, it, it really often gets discussed as having started um, in 1968, but actually we did experiment with a primary just once in Iowa in 1916. This is the progressive era in United States history where there is a lot of reform movements going on, things like city managers being developed, and that's something that uh, Iowa was, was a key part of in Des Moines, especially with a city manager role. Well, one of the other things was trying to uh, have a more open and uh, available process of nominating and so creating primaries all across the state, most uh, across the nation, excuse me, most states uh, pre-1900 had caucuses and with the progressive movement, the idea of having a primary where it's much like a uh, typical election day, you cast a ballot and we'll talk about some of those other reforms too that were taking place as we wrap up uh, connected to elections, but uh, much like, and, and we can see in this ad, it's like, oh, we should let women, or not the ad, this newspaper uh, from the Muscatine News Tribune of April 11th, 1916. Uh, the experiment with a primary by many Iowa uh, newspapers was that it was not an effective way for Iowans, and it's only Iowa men uh, in 1916 for Iowa men to engage in a, a nominating process. And so it calls it a useless primary, saying it really didn't boost participation, uh, it didn't uh, boost awareness, and so uh, 
that's the one time Iowa experiments with a primary and a presidential nominating process is the year 1916. So uh, in the earliest days, it really was was mostly going to the state convention. That's when I say eight, earliest days, 1852, 1856. Uh, you weren't really even maybe a county convention if it's a larger county like uh, Scott or Davenport where uh, delegates are, are named, but uh, generally the state convention itself is where that happened. That's, that's mostly the process today too, where you have precinct caucuses, district caucuses, uh, excuse me, county caucuses, county conventions. We'll start over. Precinct caucuses, county conventions, district conventions, and then state conventions. So that's important as we start talking about the history too uh, of the night of the first in the nation status. So I uh, just wanted to lay out that Iowa once did experiment with a primary system as well. And in primaries, what differentiates them is they're, they're much like a general election, whereas a caucus, you must be present in person. Well, again, I, I said, oftentimes the 1968 Democratic National Convention gets looked at is the disruptive force that uh, leads to opening the nominating process within the Democratic Party. And, and it actually, I would argue, goes back to the 1964 Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, where the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is the first time where a Democratic convention with Southern states uh, attendees and delegates are trying to be integrated. And so there's the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which is an integrated group of Democrats from Mississippi. And then there is the seated Democratic Party of Mississippi. And there's a huge debate on the floor as to whether the National Democratic Party should recognize as the civil rights movement and voting rights are being debated hard nationally, but especially in the American South as blacks have been prevented from voting whether to recognize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party as the true uh, representatives of that state. Well, the National Democratic Committee does not recognize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, but it causes great upset. It's what leads to the schism and, and a lot of uh, shifts in the Democratic Party where uh, the integrated Democratic Party uh, who's, takes over the the state parties within those uh, Southern states that have had segregation, but uh, causes many whites to leave the Democratic Party in 1964 and, and change parties, either supporting someone like George Wallace or, or Richard Nixon in 1968. So uh, as much upset as there was in 1968 that we're gonna talk about in a minute, that 1964 Democratic convention in Atlantic City is also disruptive and a time where it's viewed that party bosses are controlling who gets nominated and how the process is undertaken. And that just leads up to another big mess for the National Democratic Party in 1968 in Chicago. And so, you know, earlier showed that image of uh, uh, blacks and whites from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Here you have protests uh, at the 1968 Chicago Convention for the Democratic Party of police uh, attacking protesters. Um, you know, they're wearing riot helmets. They're uh, moving protesters off the street. I think on the, the left side there, uh, you could even maybe see a, a priest, uh, a man at, at least wearing a Roman collar. So it could be uh, some kind of clergy, wouldn't have to be a Catholic priest, but some kind of clergy. Uh, so people who were protesting the Vietnam War had been a messy nomination process, whether it was going to be a peace candidate like Eugene McCarthy, kind of a traditional Democrat like Hubert Humphrey, who uh, was the <clears throat> vice president, and Lyndon Johnson, who had gained the presidency through the assassination of John Kennedy. So you had that disruptive factor nationally. Uh, then you have the civil rights movement that's taking place concurrently than the Vietnam War. And so the protests around the war and peace movement uh, really causes Mayor Daley of Chicago to try to enforce uh, 
or diminish the protests. And so just an awful scene. So again, a sense that the National Democratic Party is trying to impose the process on the people as opposed to truly having a, a small d democratic process where the population and the, the everyday members are, are working to nominate a candidate that they want. So not coming from the, the party bosses like LBJ might have been viewed and a grassroots movement should have too mentioned, you know, earlier in 1968, besides uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement, you also had the assassination of Martin Luther King uh, on April 4th, and then the assassination of Robert Kennedy. So if, again, uh, terribly disruptive factors. You'd had uh, uprisings in, in many cities in 1967 and into 1968 as well. So a, a period of turmoil taking place, and especially on the political side, a view that the people really weren't being able to choose the nominee. It was all coming from the party bosses. And so that gets us set up for 1972. And a Democratic commission that says, how do we open up the process and how do we uh, change the nomination so that people feel more, more engaged? And uh, it's both uh, somewhat coincidence, uh, somewhat uh, known, but also, uh, so there's some strategy, but also uh, a little bit of just, uh, this is the way things are, that moves Iowa to first in the nation in 1972. Uh, the knew the state had, you had to have a democratic convention in May to have delegates ready to go to the national convention. Uh, part of that coincidence is that uh, the Iowa Democratic Party wanted to make sure at the precinct caucuses that people had all the rules so that people knew how the process was going to take place because it becomes a new process. Uh, that people at the county conventions would have printed rules and be able to know what the guidelines were. That at the district convention, that would be the case that printed materials would be available for all delegates. And then at the state convention, that printed material would be available. Well, at least the story that is pretty well documented is that the Iowa Democratic Party had a fairly old copying machine, a mimeograph for older people like me. Uh, you know what that means. And so to back off from the May date of the state convention pushes the precinct caucuses into January, uh, being able to get everything printed in time. So that's part of what pushes it and part of Iowa instead of uh, doing a traditional caucus where you do take, uh, you know, stand up and record uh, who is, or, or a paper ballot who you are supporting, Iowa develops through a, a <clears throat> process uh, with Richard Bender uh, saying, we're gonna have proportional voting where we're not totally going to count within the precincts who gets the most, but if you have 15% within a precinct of the people attending, that gives you a delegate out of that precinct. And if you don't have 15% in that first stand up, announce who you're supporting, your candidate is not going to be viable unless at the second chance you can pick up somebody in your precinct to say, you know, let's say it's 1972. So your candidates, uh, main candidates are uh, Edmund Muskie, Senator from Maine, uh, George McGovern from uh, <clears throat> South Dakota Senator. Also, John Lindsay, the former mayor of New York, was making a, a run, or he had, may have been a sitting mayor. I can't recall in the case of John Lindsay. And Shirley Chisholm is starting to make a little bit of noise, uh, representative of a Black woman uh, from New York as well. And so uh, those could be maybe your, and Humphrey, uh, Senator Humphrey from Minnesota, also is, is being discussed and a little bit of Eugene McCarthy as, as well. So those are some of the candidates. And if you know somebody was caucusing for Shirley Chisholm and there were only for Representative Chisholm and there were only, you know, if it was uh, 20, let's say 50 people, I can do that math a little better. Uh, and so if you didn't have uh, two people supporting Shirley Chisholm in that precinct, she wasn't viable. Uh, because you had to have 15% or higher. So, you know, uh, actually it'd be uh, on that, let's say 100, that, that way I totally can do the math. So if you didn't have that, gives you 20% uh, 
Uh, I was a little off on my math there. So uh, if you had 100 people attending, you needed at least two people supporting a candidate. If you only had one, uh, that candidate wasn't viable. So Iowa had used that, the Democrats chose that 15% viability threshold beginning in 1972 based on uh, that we had six districts in our state at the time and that one sixth is 16.6%, .6%, I think, but let's, the party decided to, to push it down to a slightly uh, more even number and said 15% will be that viability threshold. So if you had 100 people attending, you needed at least two people supporting that candidate. Uh, so that's, that's the process that was in place for Democratic uh, caucuses from 1972 to 2020. Uh, the 15% threshold is, is uh, not necessarily going to be, at least for declaring a candidate, not going to be the case in, in uh, 2024. And, and the, the issue really is that you will talk about uh, there won't be uh, declaring for candidates uh, in 2024 for Democrats. But that's the background. So you've got unrest in 1964, unrest in 1968, uh, opening up the process and both Iowa knowing the Democratic Party saying, we know this will push us forward into being first in the nation. We're not gonna supersede uh, the primary process because we're still doing caucuses. And again, the caucus is you have to be there at a specific time and place uh, within a precinct. And it was over 2000 precincts in 1972. Uh, today we're about 1600 precincts uh, for for, for across the state. And uh, so that's that's the big background on setting up 1972. Well, things that actually with that process change uh, and Senator George McGovern of South Dakota knows that I was going to be first in the nation in late 1971. So uh, Gary Hart, who would go on to be a Senator from Colorado is the, the campaign lead for the McGovern uh, campaign. McGovern knows New Hampshire is going to happen, but also says, well, my neighboring state, Iowa, is going to have its caucuses first. And so McGovern actually does start paying attention to Iowa in 1971 and had planned to do uh, a visit in late 1971, had been organizing and, and promoting his campaign uh, that time as well, but sees Iowa as a way to uh, be put on the map. So again, on this Des Moines Register newspaper from December 4th, 1971, uh, still on the front page is McGovern's getting ready to discuss his farm policy in a visit to Iowa. And being a South Dakotan, uh, you know, certainly in tune with rural America as well, uh, our population in Iowa was around uh, 2.8 million, I think, at that time, maybe a little, little more or less, but uh, right around there. And so uh, it's a chance for George McGovern to be in a state that he knows, he knows the issues. Uh, we're a little more industrial and, and a little more diverse than South Dakota, but he knows the Midwest and so sees this as a chance to campaign against the front runner. Uh, perceived front runner was Edmund Muskie of Maine. He was a senator. He had been Hubert Humphrey's 1968 vice presidential uh, pick. And so that 68 campaign of Nixon versus Humphrey, Edmund Muskie was the uh, vice presidential nominee on the, the Democratic uh, ticket. And that was uh, who the front runner was perceived as in 1971, 1972 as Senator Edmund Muskie. Well, <clears throat> uh, some national press does pay attention to the 1972 Iowa caucuses of, of January 25th uh, of that year. And uh, R.W. Apple of the New York Times uh, comes to Iowa and he's based here in Des Moines. This is of course the New York Times of January 26th, 1972. And uh, you can see on this page, you know, a discussion of the Iowa caucuses. Muskie is the victor, uh, but McGovern gets 22% of the delegate support. And again, the Iowa Democratic Party doesn't release support by numbers. They release support by delegate counts out of the precincts. And so then aggregates those and says, okay, Muskie is getting 35 point. 
5% of the delegates, Humphrey, excuse me, McGovern's getting 22.6% uh, of the uh, delegate support, so on down the line with Humphrey, Eugene McCarthy, uh, Shirley Chisholm. Sorry, I left out Scoop Jackson. Henry M. Jackson is uh, a candidate in 72 as well. Uh, but you can see uh, Representative Chisholm, as, as is depicted on the right side of this page, has just declared that she is going to join the president Joel Ray saying that she actually did get some a small amount of support in Iowa, uh, but she did did get some support. So that idea that you've got McGovern a doing better than expected, Muskie not doing as well as expected is is part of what then sets up uh, Iowa as being significant too. So when you think about the Iowa caucuses, uh, and will be the case on the Republican side this year where you've got a contested caucus if. You know, a candidate doesn't meet or exceed expectations, uh, they're going to be in trouble. And that is a little bit of what happened with Senator Muskie is, you know, it was perceived that he should get over 50 percent with the, the type of uh, advantage he had. And then when he only gets uh, 35 percent, he doesn't quite meet the expectations. And then McGovern, with his 22.6 percent, has exceeded expectations. So that really does set up... Uh, future contests that that's that's a barometer uh, in the Iowa con caucuses. And just as a point too on, on this uh, campaign, you can see this is from the Lamar's Daily Sentinel up in Northwest Iowa, the January 25th, 1972, that uh, again, a county fairly close to uh, South Dakota. So you've got, uh, Senator George McGovern doing well in Plymouth County, Iowa, at least in the town of Lamar's, whereas Rimson, the, the coverage from the Daily Sentinel is saying, you know, uh, haven't quite uh, decided uh, what what the uh, turnout is 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 there yet, that Rimson still had uh, some uncommitted voters. And, and I'll show another slide uh, next from the Des Moines Register showing some of that turnout. But uh, that's just an example of... Uh, the local coverage was was even seeing, you know, the the support for Senator McGovern as well. So here's a couple of uh, tables from the Des Moines Register of February 28th as the the final Democratic caucus results are announced. Uh, I chose kind of a, a west central and southwest Iowa uh, district, the fifth district that you know has Adair County, Adams County. Uh, but also, you know, Page and Wayne. Uh, Warren is in there, but not Polk for Central Iowa. And so you can see some of those breakdowns, and you can see that coming out of that fifth district, that that's one of those counties where uh, Representative Chisholm received some support. So she had 16% uh, of the delegate support out of Story County. Uh, so again, kind of loops around Polk County with our population, but does have Story to the north and Warren. Uh, to the south and, and uh, Boone to the northwest and Dallas to the west uh, and Madison to the southwest. And that, uh, you know, you look and see that uh, someone uh, like uh, Mayor Lindsay, I said, got a little bit of support there out of Warren County. And uh, then Henry Jackson got a little bit of support out of uh, Greene County. So where, where Jefferson is just west of uh, Boone. And, and so there was enough tracking of those delegate counts that that uh, you could see how things went. And so if in that district with 536, uh, Muskie gets 172 of the delegate support and, and that uh, McGovern gets 127. Then you go to the sixth district. Uh, again, you've got better performance uh, by Muskie in that district, but in certain counties, and, and I would just point out one like Crawford, so that's Denison is the county seat on the, the table from the sixth district on your right side of the screen, uh, you know, covering mostly uh, west central and northwest Iowa, uh, making sure I'm not missing any uh, Winnebago's north central, I suppose. Uh, so, you know, in, and then Winnebago is a good example. That's one where uh, you've got seven delegates for Muskie, seven delegates for McGovern. So it's even and six uncommitted. And, and as you can make out, uncommitted, uh, at least in the fifth district, was the leader uh, overall in the sixth 
district, you've got uh, Muskie leading overall, then second is uncommitted. But with Senator McGovern uh, doing well, and, and sorry, the uh, this is coming out of the, the final county numbers and that uh, county convention numbers uh, didn't have didn't have Clay County yet. And so, as I said, you went precinct caucuses first, then your county convention. So that's what this is reporting. And then uh, going to your district convention and your state convention. And so in Iowa, the, the state convention was going to be in May. And just so not to overlook uh, the Republican caucuses, they take place in April because you've got an incumbent president in Richard Nixon. So, uh, you know, the Iowa Republican Party certainly knows that uh, the Democrats are having their caucus in uh, January, but doesn't matter to them. They're going to keep things like most had been the case most of the time where uh, March and April were the two typical months for both the Democratic and Republican Party, early April uh, as, as typical times for the precinct caucuses. So, you know, I, I used a, a Des Moines Register store, story from April 4th, 1972, saying, you know, there's 145 precincts uh, for Polk County and that the, the precinct caucuses are going to take place then. Uh, in April. So you have the Republicans saying, fine, Democrats, do your January thing, but we don't, we don't really care about that because uh, we've got an incumbent president. But seeing the national press also uh, with some changes in the presidency uh, from President Nixon to Gerald Ford, 1976 then becomes a whole different story. Um, and it actually starts in March of 1975, and I see we're getting close to halfway through, and so I better uh, move a little faster. But this early stuff is the important stuff. So uh, you've got a Georgia governor coming into Lamar's, of, of all places. Uh, they were having an event in March to honor a longtime uh, county recorder, if I remember right, her, her name article, and I'm, I'm embarrassed that... Uh, I not, didn't didn't make note of that in, in my head, uh, but I think she'd been the the uh, county official for about 28 years. So, uh, Marie Jan, that's uh, she's in the first paragraph. So uh, it was a recognition dinner for Marie Jan up there in Plymouth County, and uh, this governor from Georgia shows up and starts saying, I'm Jimmy Carter and I'm running for president. And away he goes beginning in March, 1975. So uh, <clears throat> that is then the run up to the January 20, and he keeps campaigning. So Jimmy Carter keeps going through 1975. Uh, that entire year, other candidates do start paying attention. Uh, when I've talked to people about this, I, I remind people that, uh, uh, this I, I love this topic because it, it mirrors my own Iowa life a little bit. Uh, when I was in uh, fifth grade uh, and the Iowa caucuses were going to take place in January of 1976, uh, our uh, school had a mock caucus for the Democratic Party uh, in, in the uh, late fall of 1975. So uh, Iowa school children, at least in, in central Iowa, were paying attention to what were happening, uh, what was happening as well in this new role for Iowa. And, and so uh, can, can remember that event at my uh, school quite well. But what happens then in that January 1976 caucus is while Carter uh, really technically gets beat by uncommitted, he finishes higher than any other candidate. Uh, Birch Bayh, senator from Indiana, finishes a week second as the Des Moines Register of January 20th reports. And then uh, Republicans join in as first in the nation. And you do have a sitting president in Gerald Ford, but he was not running for re-election. He had come into the presidency uh, by becoming vice president when Spiro Agnew resigned and then becoming president when President Nixon resigned. And in this case, the Republican Party isn't releasing a statewide uh, entirety number. They selected uh, shortly before the precinct caucuses took place a select number of precincts so that nobody could stack the deck. And uh, 
had 62 sample precincts uh, where they counted the number of votes. And in that case, it was uh, a 264 vote edge for President Ford, but he's being challenged by Midwesterner uh, by birth and former Iowan and then former governor of California, Ronald Reagan. So Reagan is setting up a, maybe a 1980 campaign if he doesn't get the nomination in 1976. And so that is truly when the Republican Party says, OK, uh, we're going to join in on this first in the nation status. So 1976 is an important year because of the uh, both parties being first in the nation. But it, it's not till 1980 that the uh, Republican Party then uh, <clears throat> does the entire state. And just as a really good point to emphasize, especially with the, the turmoil that has taken place uh, since uh, the early 2000s in many ways, saying, why does Iowa get to go first? The caucuses aren't democratic. You have to be there. Well, Jimmy Carter himself, who had you know done better than expected and uses Iowa to launch his uh, successful presidential campaign of 1976, works with the National Democratic Party already to try to push Iowa out. Uh, the Jimmy Carter and his uh, supporters within the National Democratic Party want to tighten up the, the campaign period so that it runs March uh, into uh, early, early April, early June, excuse me, uh, at, the, at the latest. And uh, so that would have knocked out Jan, uh, excuse me, Iowa and New Hampshire from being first in the nation. And so, uh, as you can see, from the Des Moines Register, October 29th, 1977 story. Uh, that's uh, a wire service story saying, you know, New Hampshire's being threatened. It was called the Winograd, or Winograd, excuse me, Winograd Commission, because uh, Morley Winograd was a Democratic official from the state of Michigan who was chairing this revision process. So, even, and then in 1978, you see the Des Moines Register uh, editorial saying, you know, uh, we don't think this is a good idea either to uh, knock Iowa off of off of the first in the nation status. So uh, even though it only been two cycles, uh, the idea that the change from the Winograd Commission wasn't really going to make things uh, easier uh, or less uh, taxing on candidates, uh, it might make it more taxing by tightening up the the uh, campaign because it was going to be a shorter campaign uh, to said into uh, definitely March into it's, it's, it's going to be early May uh, as, as I talk about that. So uh, that's the change that's already being discussed to push Iowa and New Hampshire off the first in the nation status, even though that's only been in place in Iowa for two elections. Well, 1980, as I said, is a, is a big one. Uh, it's one where the Iowa Republican Party uh, opens up the, the process uh, to release returns from the entire state for the first time. Uh, you've got a sitting president in Jimmy Carter, but he's being challenged by uh, Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts and also uh, Jerry Brown, governor of California. And then you've got Ronald Reagan, former California governor, uh, George Bush, uh, George H. W. Bush, former representative from the state of Texas. Uh, Bob Dole is running. Philip Crane of Illinois. John Anderson of Illinois. Uh, should say Senator Bob Dole of Kansas, just to treat him equally. Uh, and thinking, oh, Howard Baker, uh, representative from Tennessee, uh, is is running. And then uh, think I've named all the Republican candidates. I may have missed someone, but you've got a really contested election into this perception that oh, Ronald Reagan's going to win Iowa because a he's uh, run in 1976. He used to be an Iowan. He's got uh, roots there with people that are fond of him. Well, George H.W. Bush works hard, uh, puts together a good uh, campaign. And to me, that's what, you know, Iowa is good at is it's a state where you can compete in just about any media market and you also can travel the whole state. The all 99 counties uh, wasn't known as a, a full grassly at that time, but candidates like Jimmy Carter in 75 going up to Lamar's uh, or 
George H.W. Bush in 1980, working across the state, building a network, building an effective campaign. And so George H.W. Bush beats Reagan. Reagan took Iowa for granted. Some people felt there is, and this is one of those stories and uh, again, trying to keep on my eye on time. Uh, some people, and, and David Yepsen, former Des Moines Register and then Iowa PBS uh, uh, host of Iowa Press, uh, you know, tells a story that some Reagan people feel like uh, Bush may not have really won that 1980 campaign. Uh, that's a story if you want to dig into, you can look into more on your own. Uh, Andrew Batt of Iowa PBS did a nice caucus documentary and apologies to Andrew because I may have just mispronounced his name. Anyway, 1980, huge deal because you've got uh, now both parties doing statewide delegate counts and people, either Jimmy Carter showing he's still got his strength in Iowa or George H.W. Bush exceeding expectations. And while Bush doesn't get the nomination, he does become Ronald Reagan's vice presidential nominee. So puts himself as a serious player in national politics. Uh, 1988 is another big one to talk about just because after Ronald Reagan defeats Jimmy Carter in 1980, you've got an incumbent president running in 1984. Uh, so the Republicans don't really have a contested uh, caucus in 1984. The Democrats do. That's a big one on the Democratic side. But 1988, you've got, again, a contested amongst both parties uh, with <clears throat> Bob Dole, uh, sitting vice president, George H.W. Bush now running for the nomination. Uh, and then uh, Pat Robertson, Jack Kemp, uh, Pierre DuPont. Uh, I'm trying to think of who, oh, Alexander Haig is also running that year too. So we've named everybody on the Republican side. Democrats, you've got uh, Representative Gephardt from Missouri, Senator Simon from Illinois, Governor Dukakis from Massachusetts, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson from Illinois, uh, Bruce Babbitt from Arizona, and uh, Gary Hart from Colorado, and then uh, Senator Al Gore from Tennessee. And so two big contested uh, parties, and in this one, uh, caucus campaigns. In this one, you've got George, uh, <clears throat> George H.W. Bush falling to third place as the sitting vice president with Bob Dole winning that campaign in Iowa. And then Pat Robertson exceeding expert expectations and showing the rise of uh, traditional Christian voters uh, joining the Republican Party and supporting a candidate. And, and what the Bush campaign said is, we did as well as we did in 1980. It's just that uh, Reverend Pat Robertson brought out a whole new group of Republicans. And that's something that you see happens into the 21st century. So uh, showing, you know, the rise of the evangelical voter uh, that happens in Iowa. And just to talk about that Dole campaign, uh, it, it gave a chance for a, a young operative, Tom Seinhorst of Knoxville, uh, gets credit in the Des Moines Register for really putting together uh, the successful Dole campaign of 1988. And then Tom would go on to help with the Dole, 90, Dole Kemp 96 campaign as well. So, uh, you know, it's a chance for Iowans to cut their political teeth and prove their political chops and, and maybe get themselves on uh, the national stage as people active in politics as well. And then on the Democratic side, uh, you know, you've got two Midwesterners, and it's the heels of the farm crisis, too. You should say that as well. So that's that's a part of the headwind that George H.W. Bush is fighting against, is that he had been in the Reagan uh, White House as vice president and some of the perceptions about, you know, how President Reagan uh, didn't assist with the farm crisis. So you've, uh, you know, or the critiques of uh, President Reagan during the farm crisis carry over to uh, President, Vice President Bush, whereas you have two strong candidates out of the Midwest and Richard Gephardt and Paul Simon doing well, uh, Jesse Jackson showing, even though he comes in fourth, uh, so the phrase that you hear related to Iowa, you know, three tickets out, that's where uh, Governor Dukakis gets one of those. But uh, Reverend Jackson really was trying to prove uh, his appeal to both urban and rural voters. So a, a big, important campaign there. So uh, some really important campaigns happen uh, through the 90s and the uh, early 2000s. But 
uh, for the sake of time, jumping up to 2016 and uh, just showing uh, when critiques have been hitting Iowa hard. In 2012, the uh, Republican Party of Iowa had had a very close uh, caucus between Senator Santorum of Pennsylvania and uh, then governor, former Governor Romney uh, uh, of Massachusetts. And uh, so you'd had some, some difficulty in giving a winner and that's where the media and maybe national parties really want the parties of Republican and Democratic to declare a winner that night. And if that can't be done, uh, that could be that could be a challenge. And in 2012, the Santorum versus Romney on the Republican side uh, was was really tight and contested and, and didn't have great, great results uh, in, until a day or so after. And that happens a little bit on the Democratic side then in 2016, where uh, she was Senator Clinton then against Senator uh, Sanders. Uh, Senator Sanders felt like with the delegate uh, count process that he may have actually had more support and should have benefited in 2016. Uh, Governor O'Malley of, of Virginia really didn't play much of a role. Uh, and then on the, the Republican side, you've got, uh, again, Senator Cruz versus uh, then candidate Trump uh, and uh, Senator Rubio doing well on the Republican side, but it's really on the Democratic side where uh, the the numbers in the 1700 precinct caucuses, some of those turnouts uh, and the way the delegate count is done really <clears throat> leads to some confusion as to who had the most support on the Democratic side. So trying to make some changes for 2020 and that leads, and I, I didn't put up the 2020 results for uh, Iowa, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, using that, but with the, the debate over whether it was, uh, you know, Mayor Buttigieg at the time or Senator Sanders or Senator Warren, who how support took place and then the reporting challenge challenges is, is maybe being a little generous to the Iowa Democratic Party in 2020. The, the meltdown of the reporting process the night of the caucuses where there was no clear definitive winner and there was a lot of confusion. Uh, so couldn't even say really who won. So you had 2012 uh, Republican side challenge and, and problems on that side mostly being fixed. 2016, some concern from the Sanders campaign about how numbers were being counted and, and reported. And then uh, just a, a complete, uh, you know, fiasco, I think, is, is the only way to describe what happened uh, in the reporting of 2020 for the Iowa Democratic Party. And thus, uh, leads to the changes that have happened in 2024, where Republican caucus is still first in the nation with, uh, you know, candidates like former Tr President Trump and uh, Ambassador Haley and Governor DeSantis. Uh, and say, you know, Governor Christie's now dropped out. Uh, uh, entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, some other candidates out there too. Uh, but Republicans will still be. A, uh, you know, voting for candidates this coming Monday, uh, whereas <clears throat> Democratic Party is going to have a caucus to comply with Iowa law, but uh, will only be the party business of discussing platform issues and then electing delegates to the county convention, but they will be unaffiliated delegates. So they won't be declaring and releasing any delegate counts uh, for the Iowa Democratic Party affiliated with a candidate uh, delegates will be uh, issued uh, or be uh, elected to the county convention, but they won't be affiliated with a candidate. So the Democratic Party will be complying with the Iowa law that we started our discussion with. Uh, but uh, as, as we know, Iowa is no longer first in the nation on the Democratic side. Uh, a lot of those critiques of not uh, a Democratic process. Uh, just before I leave that, if you look at primary participation as well, though, Primary participation doesn't mean that, you know, in most cases, even 50% of the eligible voters are participating. Uh, and so it's not as if primaries are some radical, wild uh, engagement in democracy event. Uh, so the, to me, the critique of the caucuses not being uh, democratic enough is, is a little hollow.
uh, when a primary uh, for a presidential candidate gets over 75% or even over 60% of the eligible uh, participants, then maybe you've got a good critique, but uh, I don't know that I mean, you've got or more of a critique. So uh, I'm a defender of the Iowa caucuses is what I'll say. Uh, they bring out an engaged uh, group of people that are, I think historically, because we didn't talk about the Obama campaign of 2008, would have been a big one to talk about. I uh, want to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to move through these next few slides. Uh, we do have the, the richest uh, caucus uh, collection documenting the Iowa uh, presidential caucus process going back from 1972. The buttons on the left are from the David Yepsen collection that we had on display in our 2016 uh, museum exhibit. And then uh, some reproductions of some of the buttons and signs that are in our collection that was also part of our 2016 uh, caucus uh, collection. And so uh, know if you're an Iowan, your state historical society is great at documenting the history of the Iowa caucuses. We care about stories from all across the state. And uh, if, if you're a viewer of this program and, and you have something, I'll, I'll probably say it again, but we'd love to, uh, uh, that, that's unique. That's, you know, we've got a lot of, of representative material, uh, but if you've got some unique material, uh, we'd love to, to hear your story. So uh, <clears throat> before I wrap up, and I want to say, you know, this whole process is to nominate presidential candidates. So uh, in our collections, uh, you can see on the left are two examples of eight, and eight, one example is an 1860 uh, Republican ticket with the rail splitter uh, Abraham Lincoln, but that is an Iowa ticket. So pre-1892, uh, in Iowa, you went to your voting place and you just said, give me the Republican ticket, or on that left side of the screen, the, the lighter colored ticket is an 1876 uh, Democratic ticket. So if it was 1860 and you wanted to vote Republican, you'd say, give me that Republican ticket. You could cross out a name and, and not vote a straight ticket, but almost everyone voted straight ticket. Uh, through that period. And then same with that 1876, just wanted to give uh, equal time to uh, both parties. So what happens is that idea of A, having a secret ballot where uh, you can uh, go into a, a privacy space and vote in secret as opposed to people knowing how you were voting if you ask for a specific ticket, that changes in 1892. So that's what's on the center screen is the sample ballot and instruction for the male voters of Iowa on how to vote on this new, what's called a blanket ballot or a, a straight or a, a typical ballot, an Australian ballot. And so Iowa goes to that blanket ballot that a lot of voters are familiar with today, uh, <clears throat> happens in 1892. And then just wanna give a shout out to a story that I just learned. And so besides having ballots that you dropped into a ballot box, voting machines, uh, start coming in the early 1900s, and it's uh, a man named Albert Gillespie of Atlantic, who is the real pioneer in automatic voting machines. So that's an automatic voting machine in our collection at the State Historical Museum. Uh, it has patents, and that <clears throat> example that I'm showing on the right side, you've got you know the green curtained voting machine uh, with that patent plate on it. Uh, the image of that voting booth that's on a patent drawing is his April 17th, 1900 patent. He is buried in Atlantic. So the idea of automatic voting machines, that was a new story to me in the last maybe uh, year. And so Matt, for our vault tours, we, we got too many stories to tell, but there's a new one for us uh, that Albert Gillespie uh, of Atlantic, Iowa, and he's buried in Cass County in Atlantic, uh, is the inventor of the modern voting machine for the most part. So he sometimes gets said he's from New York, but that's only where the voting machine companies were, was in New York. And so sometimes the patents are taken out from a New York address, but he's an Iowan. And then we are actively collecting. So uh, your state curator was out last night. That's University uh, Avenue in Des Moines near Drake University. Uh, after 11 o'clock, there were two less signs, one less DeSantis 2024 sign, and one less Nikki Haley sign along University Avenue in Des Moines and uh, was able to pick up one of the, the tickets for the Republican debate. I did stop it at uh, uh, the Iowa Events Center 
just to see if uh, related to former President Trump's event, uh, could collect anything. So if uh, you were an attendee and you have something, please reach out, talk to me. Uh, I'm gonna put my contact information up uh, here in a second. If you wanna learn more about civic engagement, uh, would encourage you to visit us at the Civics in Action exhibit at the State Historical Building. Uh, we're open 9 to 4.30, Monday through or Tuesday, 9 to 4.30, Tuesday through Friday at this time. Uh, and if you need to check, uh, you can always go to history.iowa.gov. And again, if you want to reach out to me about any Iowa history topic, uh, Leo Landis, state curator, and that's leo.landis at iowa.gov. So thanks so much, Jess. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, viewers. And uh, take questions now. Well, thank you, Leo. You have clearly spent a lot of time to gain an understanding of this topic. And I love how it mirrors the timeline of your life. I really liked how you shared that caucus you did as a, as a young boy in the Des Moines metro area. From your view and your research, what do you think are some of the most surprising ways candidates have found success in the Iowa caucus? A good one. And so most surprising way Iowans, I think Rick Santorum's campaign of uh, 2012 is a really good example uh, where he, you know, kind of did his own Jimmy Carter version where uh, I think he was out of the U.S. Senate by the time he starts campaigning, uh, but he works hard. He shows and, and didn't talk as much about this, but, you know, what resonates is, you know, a candidate who's working hard, who gets their name out across the state and then you know, appeals to a party's voter or brings in new voters. And so Pat Robertson does that in 1988. Uh, Rick Santorum does that, I, I would argue, in the, you know, 2011-2012 campaign. And so you've got someone like uh, then uh, Senator Romney uh, looking to, I think he was a sitting senator, maybe he still have just been governor of Massachusetts, you would know maybe too, Jess. Anyway, I think that I think that Santorum campaign of 2011 is another good example where, you know, building on what Jimmy Carter did, proving that a candidate who's got a great message maybe doesn't get the nomination. And, and that's one of those things to remind people is, uh, you know, an Iowan who pays attention would say, we don't always, you know, nominate the winner, but, uh, or the person who gets the nomination for a party, but we show where currents in a party are going in many ways that maybe a larger state wouldn't. And, you know, we've got a population of now over 3 million people. Uh, I think, you know, someone, again, not to just go on about Senator Santorum, uh, but shows shows that appeal. And, and if you look at the maybe Democratic side, again, that 2008 campaign with, uh, you know, junior senator from Illinois, Barack Obama, proving that, you know, here's somebody that can get a message that resonates and does get the nomination and wins the presidency. So uh, I think those are two good in the last uh, 16 years examples of, of surprising, you know, we take the, maybe the, the uh, some people I shouldn't say we, many people take maybe the, the Senator Obama nomination now for granted, but to see that, you know, victory in the Iowa caucuses and, and working hard and having a message that resonates across a wide population. And again, uh, Senator Santorum's campaign showing, again, some of that evangelical support that that becomes critical, uh, maybe, you know, for a Donald J. Trump victory uh, in in 2016 and, and also, uh, you know, a 2020 campaign as well. Well, thank you for those observations. And why do you think Iowans have preferred the caucus process versus the primary process over time? I, I think, A, uh, Iowans might at times be resistant to change. It's like we've done a caucus. Uh, we tried a primary once, not that any of us remember the, or the 1916 uh, effort at a primary, but it has worked well. Uh, for the most part, uh, and, or it has worked well into the early 2000s. And so, and it has the inertia after 1972 of saying, oh, it's put us first in the nation. And if we went away from a caucus, New Hampshire state law would say, well, oh, Iowa's now doing a primary. Sorry, Iowa, uh, we're jumping ahead of you now because you're doing a primary. 
And I do, I, I understand the argument that uh, a caucus doesn't allow for the degree of participation that you can see in a primary. So I, I'd certainly recognize that. Uh, you know, I think there's other ways to, to get around those issues, but I think it's partially because Iowans might be a little resistant to change. It served us well and put us first in the nation by maintaining that caucus status. And as I said earlier, it really, you know, we'll get 20 to 30 percent of the eligible participants. And you do, you have to be registered with a party, but a lot of primaries, you know, uh, make you be registered. Most primaries, I think, in, in other states make you be registered with a specific party to participate. So, uh, you know, other states that are doing primaries oftentimes don't get above 30 percent participation in their primaries. So the, the idea that primaries, you know, give this they give a greater opportunity, but for whatever reason, you don't get greater participation from the electorate. So uh, I think, again, some of those critiques, and that wasn't your question, but it's like, it, I've talked enough about it. Let's go to another question. Okay, well, we have talked, Leo, about how much time you have spent on this topic. And I wondered, what are your favorite sources around this topic? Uh, you know, there have been some really good good books, uh, especially people like uh, <clears throat> David Redlosk, who uh, has paid attention, or uh, John Skipper, uh, former Mason City journalist, really liked his book. Again, he, he covers the state, but it's a non-central Iowa-based, and I should say the late John Skipper, really good, solid uh, Iowa journalist and, and historian out of Mason City, uh, who passed away last year, if I remember correctly. Uh, his his caucus book is a good one. Uh, you know, when you're looking at primary sources, the the originals, uh, we've been fortunate to get some materials and, and been able to talk to people like David Yepsen and hear some of their perspectives on covering the caucus. Uh, uh, Diane Bystrom has been helpful in the past to us uh, of Iowa State, who had been at the CAT Center up there. And, and Karen Kondrowski has been good to work with, too. And, and even the folks at Drake and the Harkin Center and the political science uh, department there. So uh, been some, if I didn't say Dave Price, uh, his work on caucus history, too, of the more recent past is, has been some good, good material as well. So uh, lots of great scholarship, both uh, kind of primary source material uh, to look at and uh, some donations that we've had as, as well to help understand the, the Iowa caucus history have been, been great. That's a really broad variety of sources. And thanks for taking the longer answer and not just saying newspapers, which you clearly do also use a lot. <laughs> now, now, this will be our final question today. As you've researched the Iowa caucus process, what do you think is the biggest gap in available sources or gap in research? What, what are we missing as we look back on this approximate 40 plus year story of political yeah. history in Iowa? Yeah, Andrew Bott of uh, Iowa PBS did some good interviews uh, for his caucus documentary. And so uh, that's at least one thing that he helped fill some gaps on. But I think in that pre-1988 uh, run, doing oral histories and interviews with, uh, you know, some of the Iowa uh, activists um, to get some perspectives. You know, that David Yepsen, uh, you know, has suggested at times there ought to be a, a concerted Iowa oral history process to, you know, we're, we're, we've lost a number of people from the early 1970s, uh, even people like, you know, Representative Neil Smith, who was around at that time and, and had been a long time uh, representative, 14 years, I think, even going into uh, the 72 caucus, I could be off by a couple of years, but, you know, to have done some mortal histories on, uh, with people like him. So those are some things or, you know, uh, and you can correct me on names and I'm going to try to wrap up before uh, we finish off our hours. So Mary Louise Smith, did I get that right, Jess, uh, who is with the National Republican Committee and, and chair. I believe so. Yeah, I think I've got her name right. Uh, you know, to sit down and talk to her about that 1976 into early 80s uh, campaigns specific to her uh, 
thoughts on the Iowa caucus and what worked and what what didn't. So uh, those are some gaps that, uh, it, but if there are people in communities, and this is my last point, who have photographs of candidate events in that, you know, maybe pre-2000 era, uh, my colleagues in special collections in Iowa City and Des Moines and I would, would you know, uh, Allison uh, Johnson in Iowa City and, and uh, my colleague Jessica Ney here in Des Moines would, would love to hear if you've got some photographs or materials related to candidate events. So uh, that's what I'll leave us with. So thanks so much to everyone. Thank you, Leo. And with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close. Thank you to everyone joining us today. We would like to extend one last thank you to our presenter, State Curator Leo Landis, and we hope that everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories to tell throughout 2024. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series or to watch recordings, check out our website at history.iowa.gov. Looking to learn more Iowa history? You can find and watch over 50 recorded webinars of past Iowa History 101 programs on the Iowa Culture YouTube channel. We look forward to virtually seeing you for the next Iowa History 101 webinar on January 25th Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon.